Sun is putting some fire to partly cloudy skies over Kathmandu, the capital of Nepal, as cargo is being loaded into our EMB 110 P1K Bandarante freighter. The city and its nearly 1 million residents are situated in the Kathmandu Valley, which is a broad, flat basin surrounded by the mountainous terrain of the Nepali Himalaya foothills. This topography sets us up for an interesting departure procedure that will help us safely ascend above the terrain before making our way east to the famous Haro International Airport in Bhutan. Inside the cockpit we've got the iPad and our flashlight to guide the way through our startup checklist. We're going to run through the full internal standard procedures lists in the pilot's operating handbook. I've added a link to a pair of real-world external inspection videos for the EMB-110 if you'd like to check those out. There's a lot to go through and I'll try to keep it moving quickly so let's get started. The flight log and maintenance records have been reviewed and uh, the number of hours until next inspection, fuel, oil, hydraulic fluid and oxygen, and allowable envelope for weight and balance have been checked. Trim tabs check for full travel and true neutral. Circuit breakers on the left and right side check. Parking brake is set and gust locks have been removed and the switches and radios are as they're needed for now. No radar to check. Propeller synchro is off and then the gyro horizon and lighting emergency supply switch gets tested, although that's not yet implemented. Landing gear is down and the emergency gear switch is in the normal position. Air conditioning is off and oxygen pressure would be checked, but that's not implemented. Now something I missed here is the power levers should be at minimum, but they've booted in reverse and I neglected to jiggle my throttle around the detent to reset them. And propeller levers move to maximum RPM and fuel condition levers check as full cutoff. Then trim tabs check at neutral and green. And then if we had them, a hand pump handle, fire extinguisher, hatchet, and full face mask would be checked, but uh, that's not implemented. Then the hydraulic selector valve would check for normal position as well, but that's also not implemented. And now we'll switch to external battery power and bolt meters get checked. And then we'll open up our clear vision window and have a chance to ask the ground crew for a pitot heat check. So we'll turn that on and then also confirming that the inertial separation is off and then with ground crew confirmation that the heat is on we'll shut that pitot heat back off for now. And the directional gyro would get set to slave mode there and then shut off valve switches check as off and then fire test. That checks. And our fuel totalizer is zeroed and the fuel quantity checks for ample fuel into Paro and back out to our next destination without needing to refuel there. The enunciator panel checks. Smoke detector system would be checked here but that's not implemented. And then at a battery checkpoint we're going to continue leaving it on external. So cargo and minimal passenger loading are being watched for care and balance until all that's settled and we'll ask the ground crew to remove and gather and stow for us. Uh, just remembering that something in the startup procedure resets the electronic flight bag selection, so I'm getting them back where they should be here. Or we could use them to simulate requesting the wheel chocks, tail rod, and cones get removed and stowed. And then with cargo, flight crew, and two passengers on board, we'll close up the doors. and we'll turn off the iPad and stow it for now. The seats, pedals, and belts are adjusted and parking brake checks are set. Anti-collision beacon gets turned on and we'll get these interior lights on to help us out here. And then turn on our handy seat belt and no smoking signs and then we'll turn on inverter 2. That checks. So we'll also turn on number 1. Uh, door ajar light is off and then switch on hydraulic booster pump and we'll close up the clear vision window and then turn on both sets of main and auxiliary fuel pumps and next up we'll check out our flight plan in the Garmin the winding approach procedure to Paro by itself loads up 11 waypoints along a 33 mile course and for our departure we'll set nav to the Kilo Tango Mike VOR at 113.2 
And for our primary HSI, we'll set that to 105 degrees for the eastward outbound course that we're going to intercept after circling clockwise around north of the BOR. And then the co-pilot HSI, we'll set that to 84 degrees for the radial that we'll cross when we want to ensure banking left to intercept that 105 radial. And then setting our 19,000 foot cruising altitude into the autopilot. Now on to engine startup and we'll hit start for our right engine and we'll watch for positive oil pressure and a right NG of 12%. And then after that we'll bump the right fuel condition lever to low idle. Now we'll check that temperature doesn't peak at uh, 1,090 degrees Celsius for more than two seconds, which is a situation not even close to modeled here. Uh, but then after 45% NG, we check and switch that starter off. And then we'll confirm minimum of 40 PSI on oil pressure, hydraulic pressure that's in the green, and oil temperature of 74 to 80 degrees Celsius and that the fuel lights don't illuminate after the starting cycle completes. And then the same process now with the left engine. So we, we're going to watch for positive oil pressure and again uh, getting above 12% NG. So that's good. We set the fuel condition to low idle for that engine. And then um, We'll watch for 45% NG, and we'll switch that starter off. And then check temperature and pressure ranges and for any fuel lights. And then the starting cycle is complete, and we'll switch on the AC to cozy it up a bit in here. And per a service memo in the handbook, we should switch the AC from manual to auto. Now we can switch to internal battery power and we'll call for an external battery disconnect. Then we'll turn on the generators. and then uh, check the voltmeters to the extent they're modeled here. We'll be flying through freezing temperatures, so we'll activate pitot heat. And we'll do a battery temperature check and test. Then arm the gyro horizon and lighting emergency supply switch. Radios check, no radar, and turning the transponder to standby. Although it's not implemented, nose wheel steering would be turned on at this point. So now to review our departure briefing. We're going to depart runway 20 on the IGRIS 1A SID and then climbing straight to the Kilo Tango Mike BOR, reaching it at a minimum of 4,700 feet. Then we'll turn right to circle clockwise around the VOR and stay within four nautical miles of Kilo Tango Mike. And then reaching the 84 degree radial at a minimum of 7,500 feet, we'll begin banking left toward an intercept with the 105 radial, where we'll then head to the Igris waypoint, meeting that at a 10,500 foot minimum. And checking ATIS now to update our altimeter. Okay, 30.09. Landing and departing runway 20. VFR aircraft, say direction of flight. All aircraft read back hold short instructions. Okay, only realizing that beta light is glowing up there and knocking power out of reverse into minimum where it should be. Grabbing our IFR clearance here. And toggling the transponder back to standby mode after it auto-populates and activates there.
So avionics, autopilot, GPS, and altimeter are set. Fuel pumps check on, and then turn on taxi lights, and no anti ice needed yet in getting your taxi clearance. All right, parking brakes off. We'll back out just a bit here. We duck down and we'll check our beta lights in the process. That looks good. Let's just wind our way over to a good engine run-up spot. So we'll do a little bit of weaving here and check the turn slip coordinators, RMIs, and HSIs to be sure they're paired and acting correctly. Looks good. So no radar testing needed, we're not equipped. And we'll park it right here for just a bit. So we're gonna do a fuel system test that's not actually implemented in this model, but. So first shut off the left main switch and check that there's intermittent illumination on the left aux light, and then cross feed on and the intermittent light should stop then left main back on, right main off, no right aux light, then cross feed off and intermittent right aux light now, and then right main back on. And now we'll feather the propellers twice to circulate oil in the propeller hubs. Next up, we'll turn on the autopilot and move down where we can see the enunciators and then hit the test button. Enunciators check. And then we'll check that the flight controls will deactivate the autopilot, which checks. And no electric trim system to test, but we'll check our trim tabs again for neutral and we'll move that elevator trim back into the green after that test. Next up are three engine run-up tests, which have actions and values that aren't fully modeled here, but we'll show the process. For the secondary low pitch stop check, we turn the AC to off or vent, and then we check that propellers are at max RPM, fuel condition at low idle, and power at minimum. We note the NH, and then push and hold these beta test buttons, which don't work, <laughs> and slowly move power to taxi range as the beta lights illuminate which I'll have to move to reverse to show that illumination taking place. And we check that NH stabilizes at five to six percent above the original value, then release the beta buttons and watch NH build back up and return the power to minimum. And we switch the AC back on after that. For the overspeed governor check, propellers are at max RPM, power is at minimum, and we push and hold the uh, non-functional overspeed test buttons then advance power to ensure that it stabilizes at about 70% NH. Then return power to minimum and release the buttons. For the automatic feathering check, propellers are at max RPM and we would put auto feather in the test position, but this isn't modeled here. Then advance power to 800 foot-pounds of torque Both auto feather lights should come on at this point. Then 
then we retard the left lever and at 420 to 320 foot pounds the right light should extinguish and at 250 to 150 the left light should also extinguish. And same process for the right lever. Left light should extinguish at 420 to 320 then right light also at 250 to 150. Then return power to minimum and we should activate auto feather at the end of this test, but I've missed that at the moment. So run up is complete and the last few items to care for. Parking brake confirmed set and thrust is at idle. No additional lighting needed and then turning on inertial separation. Flaps to 25%. Yaw damper and flight director are on. Flight control movement is free and unhindered. Confirming propeller sync is off and then check activation of auto feather here. We'll check the tram control for neutral and green again, then takeoff data and emergency briefing, confirming takeoff torque of 1,795 foot-pounds, VR will be 85 knots, and a takeoff distance of 2,950 feet. Uh, we're full, almost fully loaded. Ground roll, uh, 1,900 feet, and accelerated stop distance of 4,100 feet. So with the 10,098 foot runway, that gives us adequate ground stop distance if we have to abort at VR. Uh, climb torque is 1,780 foot pounds. Climb speed of 1,700 feet per minute at 126 knots. And engine out climb would be 325 feet per minute with one engine at 115 knots. Uh, with VMC, we have adequate uh, visibility for return to the airport and keeping a shallow bank angle on one engine. And we'll set navigation, anti-collision, and landing lights. Radios, attitude, and course indicators check. RMI and gyro compass check. No radar to check. And transponder is on. AC goes off. Enunciator panel is clear. Propeller levers are at maximum and move fuel condition to high idle. Let's move up to our hold point and we'll get our takeoff clearance. Update that altimeter Clear pressure. I made a little time gap here. I needed to fuss with a few things, but I've pulled up the VFR map now, with that taking the place of what I have running on an iPad. taxi a bit to the end of the runway. Nice spacious turnaround here. power to about 50 percent. And release the brakes and continue increasing power. Rotating. 
Madeira. just a bit to get us over 130 knots and flaps up. Over the VOR beacon now at 4,900 feet and we'll start our right turn. It's a hazy valley down there today, as I suspect it probably is often. to stay within four nautical miles of the VOR as we climb into this patchy cloud layer. Bringing power and propeller down to 91%. I nudged over four miles DME just a tad here, so I need to pull that back in. I struggled with sketchy behavior on the autopilot during initial climb, so I'm flying this manually until we're lined up on the outbound radial and stabilized on our way to the Igris waypoint. Okay, watching the co-pilot HSI, and that shows us at the 85 degree radial now, so we can start to ease left to intercept the 105 radial, uh, and we'll be looking at our primary HSI for that. And that 105 radial is almost lined up now. So we're in straight stable flight and can switch the CDI to GPS and activate autopilot in nav mode. adjust the climb rate to a leisurely 800 feet per minute. Turning the AC back on. Landing and taxi lights can go out. And it's more than bright enough now to cut off the cabin and nacelle lighting. Inertial separation off. And we're passing Igris at 12,000 feet, so well above the minimum. Auto feather off and propeller sink on. 
shut the hydraulic booster pump off. The engine instruments check and no change to cabin signs. And then check of the non-existent oxygen valve and autopilot checks. The high terrain is a bit obscured right now. And I'm going to negotiate flight level 190 from ATC. So working with altitude and vertical speed on the autopilot is kind of finicky. But what's basically happening here is I'm clicking the knob to show altitude and scrolling the large knob for thousands, small knob for hundreds to set 19,000 feet then clicking again to get vertical speed. The indicator at the bottom left says arm, but turning the dials, nothing happens. So click the engage button, no interface change, but now I can adjust vertical speed. Be sure you scroll in the right direction and you see the up arrow in this case, and definitely verify against your VSI to be sure it took. So yeah, getting a better look at the Himalayas now. should have turned on PX heat sooner. It needs to be activated when the outside air temperature is below 5 degrees Celsius and it looks to be about negative 10 now. It's labeled PAX heat and described as passenger heat in the next gen manual but I'm pretty sure it should be labeled as PX and that it activates heat to the fuel control unit. At least based on what I see in the pilot's operating handbook. And since we're off and on through clouds I'm activating the rest of the anti-icing system. Now that we're at cruise altitude, I'm bringing propeller RPM down to 83% NH and adjusting power downward. Switching altimeter to uh, standard pressure. And we can release our couple of passengers to stretch their collective legs for a bit as we fast forward our way across the foothills. It's interesting to see this swaying. I'm not sure if it's an ultra slow motion Dutch roll, but yaw damper is activated. I don't think it's anything that's at all noticeable at normal speed. It's probably just periodic interpolated course corrections from the autopilot. I think they're calling this descent to 17,000 feet a bit early, but uh, we're in VMC and it's clearly not an issue. Buckle up them belts, you guys. We're going to start riding down into the mountains.
This next descent leg should go to 15,200 feet per the approach procedure. Again, they may be calling this a bit early, and I'm going to hold off until PR 842 based on the approach plate. But reducing speed to 140 knots. dropping flaps at 25%. Propeller sink off and auto feather on. Hydraulic booster pump on and hydraulic pressure instruments check out. Okay, activating our 15,200 foot descent. and continuing the descent to 13,800 feet as we approach PR-799. Interesting settlement isolated on that ridge down there. It might be the Jana Dinka Monastery? Alright, cabin signs are on. No utility lights needed. Closing the imaginary oxygen valve. And ignition and PX heat are good. Activating inertial separation a bit early and switching landing lights on. Looks like we'll be in great shape for a visual approach. And we'll turn the anti icing off. and AC turns off. Now if there is an inversion or IMC surprise on the other side of this ridge, our decision altitude is 10,290 feet and we'll climb to 16,000 feet for a missed approach and follow the valley out to the south to the PR-798 fix if that happens. Gear down. As soon as we cross this saddle up here into the next valley, I'll disengage autopilot and hand fly it the rest of the way in so I can be sure we don't come in too high. So descent rate advised on the approach plate puts you at decision altitude right at the runway, nearly 3,000 feet too high. I'm probably totally misunderstanding something, but that's really goofed up my first couple runs on this approach, so we'll be dropping fast so that the final approach is better stabilized at least as far as it can be for this front airport. Okay, I can't get the altimeter to adjust for some reason. Okay, autopilot's off. Ooh, she really activity. wants to pitch up. Turn right heading autopilot left us nose up on the elevator trim, so three. that needs centered. Alright, nose wheel steering controls would turn on at this point. No radar to check. And adjusting flaps between 75 and 100% to help with airspeed as we drop down fast.
landing gear checks down, and managing flaps moment to moment. Looks like everybody's burning their dead leaves and such in a concentrated spot down there. Control sure did wait until the last fleeting moments to hand me over to Paro Tower. Hope we can both talk fast. Paro Tower, 6071123, miles northwest inbound, RNAV Zulu runway 15 approach. 607 Wind Calm, cleared on Abdullah runway 15 approach. 607 Wind Calm, cleared to land runway 15. There she is. Clear to land runway 15. Glad I'm cleared with like 30 seconds to go. This is such an amazing final approach. Whoop, flared too much there. And just a little left rudder. And nose down. moving propellers to 100% RPM. Last time I did this landing, I tried running some of my after landing checklist while it, we were still in motion during taxi to be efficient and such. And I nearly drifted into that fence over there on the left. So we'll stop for just a bit. Alright, nav lights off, anti-collision to rotating, and landing lights off and taxi on. Inertial set stays on for now. Auto feather off, transponder off, flaps up, AC on, fuel condition to low idle. Trim tabs check neutral, PX and pitot heat off. Let's get moving on down the road again.
Wonder what special traffic drives up to that little area. And rubbernecking will drift you into a ditch. Modeling at this airport is very cool. So looking around here, let's see if we can spot our ground crew. I need to check out these murals at some point too. Okay, I don't see a ground crew. I don't need a ground crew. I see my cargo and loading spot right here. Just ease in over these oil stains. Parking brake set. Taxi light off. Power lever to minimum and propellers to feather. AC off and fuel condition to cut off. Inertial step off, radios off if that function were modeled, no radar, autopilot off, anti-collision beacon off, nose wheel control off, and hydraulic boost pump off, fuel cross feed checks off, and main and auxiliary fuel pumps off. Propeller levers go back up to 100. And then seat belt and no smoking signs off, inverters off, and generators off. And we'll pop open the doors to this majestic valley. And here we are at Paro International Airport in Bhutan. I'm still loving this aircraft and looking forward to future updates that will hopefully activate more of those uh, inoperative systems and modeling. I hope you enjoyed the journey with me. Please leave a comment if you saw any glaring mistakes or have any feedback, and happy flying.